Yeah, and I think we've got to look beyond Trump to what's going on in the Republican Party. I mean, the political scientists have told us uh, what are the indicia of an authoritarian or a fascist political party. One is they don't accept the outcome of democratic elections that don't go their way. Two, they embrace or they refuse to disavow political violence as an instrument for obtaining and maintaining political power. Three, they're organized not as a democratic political party, but as an autocratic cult of personality around one charismatic or allegedly charismatic figure. And four, they don't advance policy platforms and issues that the public can debate, but they engage in scapegoating, racism, anti-Semitism, immigrant bashing, gay bashing, and so on. So they got mad at uh, our great president, Joe Biden, when he said there were semi-fascist currents yep. running through the Republican Party. But the shoe semi-fits, you semi-wear it. Yeah, that's right. Um, and we're talking to uh, Ann Applebaum in the next hour. And we've obviously talked to Tim Snyder about these concepts of anticipatory obedience, right? The idea that people are fearful of what happens if Donald Trump comes into power because he has spent years talking about what he will do to critics, opponents, journalists, uh, politicians, lawyers, prosecutors. It shouldn't work in a democracy, but it seems to be having some effect. The most recent examples are the two major newspapers who, uh, despite a habit of endorsing people, and you can like that or not and like that, not like it, they've just decided they're not doing it right now. I do worry conceptually about the effect that this has, the chilling effect on people that if Donald Trump comes in, he's going for you. Well, look, you can feel the spreading anxiety among the vast majority of Americans who reject fascism and authoritarianism right now. And the only antidote to that kind of anxiety is activism, is going out and talking to people and finding those uh, remaining undecided voters and moving them. But there's no doubt that fascism thrives on fear and promoting anxiety in the public. And we know uh, the Republican Party has let us down. The U.S. Senate let us down in the second impeachment with only a 57 to 43 vote. We needed 67 uh, votes. The Supreme Court is in Donald Donald Trump's pocket. So we're relying on the people here. But what I'm seeing all over the country is a massive outpouring of activism and engagement uh, with this process. And so they're trying to undermine it with fear and anxiety. But I think the people are going to hang tough. You are uh, involved in an election yourself. I was talking to Sherrod Brown. And, you know, when you're running for an election, your constituents are worried about what they're worried about. So what's what's the thing that works right now? Are you 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 know, when you're talking about this um, fascism stuff, that's only really going to move either undecided voters or sort of weak Trump voters who are, you know, want a permission structure to not vote with him. Or is it better to spend your time on people who are less committed Democratic voters and say, come on, uh, come on out and cast your ballot? What where does the win lie? Well, you know, there are different dimensions to the whole Project 2025 politics that Trump has set into motion. I mean, uh, I've got tens of thousands of federal workers who live in my district in Maryland, and they are rightfully concerned about Donald Trump and Project 2025. In voting for Vice President Harris, I assume that her public policy views are vastly different from my own. But I am indifferent in this election as to her policy views on any other issues than America's democracy, the Constitution and the rule of law, as I believe all Americans should be. In the 2024 election for president of the United States, there are no more important issues for America, end quote. Joining me now is J. Michael Ludig. He previously served on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. He is one of the most respected legal minds in this nation. That's why days before January 6, 2021, the then Mike President, Vice President Mike Pence sought his advice about what the Constitution says about the certification of the Electoral College votes, advice that helped the country avoid a constitutional crisis. Judge Ludig, thank you for being back on the show this morning. Thank you, Ali. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Sir, you believe that the choice in the presidential race is clear, uh, that Kamala Harris is is fit for office. Uh, Donald Trump is not fit for office. Uh, Apparently, this is not clear to many Americans because the race shows uh, a a deadlock, according to the polls. So this is the last 10 days to convince people of of what the issue is. Tell me what your, your best argument is right now. Ali, I I hope that... uh, Americans come to their senses uh, over the course of the next 10 days and understand just what is at stake in this upcoming election, and that is America's democracy and the rule of law. 
nothing more but nothing less. The various policy positions, sundry policy positions that separate the two candidates in this election is of comparatively little significance to their respective views on American democracy and the rule of law. Ali, the, uh, our democracy and the rule of law are the uh, constitutional uh, pillars, the cornerstones of our constitutional republic. It, it, it's uh, our democracy and the rule of law that, that have made America the envy of the world for almost 250 years. Uh, Donald Trump, over the past four years, beginning on January 6, 2021, has corrupted America's democracy and rule of law. The other two fundamental tenets of, of, of our Constitution and of, of our Republic are the willingness of presidential aspirants to accept the will of the American people when they vote on election day this year in 10 days. The other fundamental tenet is that every presidential candidate, every candidate for the office of the presidency must, must pledge to a peaceful transfer of power. Without the acceptance by the candidates of the will of the American people and their, their pledge to a peaceful transfer of power, America would have no democracy, Allie. Judge, uh, the preservation of democracy all through history, whether it's in America or in other countries, can come at some cost to the individual citizen. Uh, and, and look, I, I, you know, I, I think this is an important message coming from a, a person like you, because some people have called you called you names. They've 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 accused you of things for standing by your principles. And of course, it was a little less hot on January fourth uh, and fifth of of twenty twenty when you were considering twenty twenty one when you were considering these things. But what is your advice to people who are struggling with? Will they be, will they say I'm betraying my cause, my party, uh, my conservative values in in voting for Kamala Harris? Well, the, the, the answer is, is obvious, uh, Allie. They would not be betraying their cause or their political party. They would instead be putting their country, putting the United States of America before both their party and themselves. This is not a difficult decision for Americans, or at least it ought not be. Though Republicans in particular, they must decide whether they are willing to put their country, to put America above themselves and their political party. And they must be honest with themselves, finally. If they are unwilling to do so now, they will never do so. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. Uh, this is a decision uh, that, that all of us must live with the rest of our lives. And uh, as I said in my endorsement of, of the vice president, I do not want to live with the, the, the idea that I cast a vote in favor of Donald Trump in light of his corruption of America's democracy and the rule of law uh, over the past four years. We, we must remember, and the Republicans dismiss this, but Donald Trump is being prosecuted by the United States of America for perhaps the gravest crimes that an incumbent president could commit. Is it really going to be the case that Americans will return to the White House, that man who is being prosecuted by the United States for those grave crimes, I do not want to believe that that's possible, and I hope that it's not. 
Judge, you have something in common with John Kelly. He's a military man. You're you're a man of the the, the system of justice. Uh, both of which have have tried not you know not to, not to be political. You have both spent your careers in institutions that typically try and stay out of politics. Um, John Kelly's on the record interview with the New York Times about how Trump, Donald Trump meets the definition of a fascist is a watershed moment in this election. I want to ask you on a on a personal level. You had to. Did you wrestle with the the idea that you standing up for your beliefs in country over party cause you to wade into the political sphere? Because I, I've known you for a while, and I I don't think that was the most comfortable place for you in the beginning. People who understand the law understand how dangerous Trump is, and whether that's lawyers, prosecutorial types like Raskin. Remember, he was literally guys. Trump's prosecutor in the in the Senate trial. Remember how it works, right? You get impeached by the House, uh, and that's a simple vote, and then it gets sent over to the Senate. And usually, one of the the leaders from the House is is chosen to be the prosecutor. Uh, and that was in uh, one of the cases was Raskin. One of the cases was Schiff, if you recall. Uh, but Raskin is one of those people. And then you also have Judge Ludwig, right? Like, you know, in the, in the court of public opinion, in the court of democracy, they're screaming at him saying, shut the hell up. Stop wasting democracy's time. We cannot abide this any longer. So whether it's in the literal courtrooms or whether it's in the court of public opinion, the court of public discourse, judges, prosecutors, they are making their case. And it's because they understand the rule of law. And there's a you know ideological thing. Jamie Raskin is relatively uh, he's a he's a progressive member of the Democratic House delegation. Um, you know he's close with people like AOC. He's not of the squad, but he is you know friendly to them, and I like that. I'm very much a fan of Raskin. Um, and then you have Ludwig, who is in the last fifty years one of the most conservative judges and one of the most influential conservative judges. He was he could have been a Supreme Court judge. It's just, you know, the timing didn't work out for him. And yet they are united on this, saying that if you believe in the rule of law on everything from counting the votes to uh, respecting procedure to, you know, we don't have a king or nobles in this country that are immune partially or fully from criminal prosecution, then Donald Trump is an existential threat. He's not the first threat. He won't be the last but he is existential in this moment. And so I think it's important we highlight these voices. You know, it's not logic or feelings. It's not one or the other. You could have deep feelings of concern for Trump taking power again. But then also there's the hard logic. The people who understand the rule book of democracy in the court of public opinion and in the courtroom are sounding the alarm bells. We got to listen.